And I think we're going to go ahead and get started. These numbers are trickling in. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Jordan Ryan. I'm the architectural archivist at the Indiana Historical Society. And you're here with us to talk about living the legacy. So a little bit about the Indiana Historical Society. Um, we collect and preserve Indiana's unique stories. We bring Hoosiers together in remembering and sharing the past and we inspire a future grounded in our state's uniting values and principles. So here at the Indiana Historical Society, we use collections, programs, exhibits, publications, and more to contextualize history. So one of the first things we wanted to do with the Bicentennial was talk about redlining and different um, forms of, of inequity in the city. And we're starting that with Living the Legacy series, which is a free series of interdisciplinary community conversations. And tonight um, is the second part of this series, which is part of kicking off our Indianapolis Bicentennial exhibit. So a little bit of thank yous. Uh, Beth, you can go to the next slide. So the Living the Legacy series has been made possible through a grant from Indiana Humanities in cooperation with the National Endowment for the Humanities and from the Indianapolis Foundation, a CICF affiliate. But I also want to thank our incredible steering committee who have been helping us cultivate these conversations, questions, and resources. I really appreciate your time and expertise. So a little logistics for this event. Stacia, our moderator, and our panel will introduce themselves and their work and have a conversation. At the end of the program, we will have time for audience questions. If you have a question as we're going along, drop it in the Q&A section and we'll keep an eye on them. You've all been muted tonight, but we do want to hear from you. So you can add comments in the chat box. Um, you can you know, make sure you're replying to panelists and attendees so everyone can see your reply, or if you have an individual or private comment. Um, as part of our work on this program, we will be putting together a toolkit of resources. And so keep an eye on the chat box because we will be inserting links in URLs as we go. And note that this program is being recorded. So you can watch the video afterwards on our website and on our YouTube channel. And we're going to launch a brief poll now as part of our grant evaluation purposes. So that should pop up. All right, hopefully you've all had time to answer our brief poll and a little bit about the history. Let's center this conversation a bit on history in the archives. Beth, okay, thanks. Um, so first, uh, let's sort of define what redlining is. Um, so we're all kind of coming from the same page. Redlining is a discriminatory practice by which banks and mortgage lenders and insurance companies refused or limited loans, mortgages and insurance within specific geographic areas, uh, particularly in older and inner city neighborhoods and to non-white and or low income families by the guidance of the Federal Housing Administration's Homeowners Loan Corporation. In addition to that, realtors and real estate developers often misrepresented markets and discriminated against prospective home buyers in order to control market values. So redlining has created both cultural and financial dynamics that favor white home buyers um, while also creating an adverse effect for particularly black communities. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so this slide shows you some of the area description forms from these redlining maps. Um, so these are reasons why the HLC would devalue neighborhoods, aka redline them. And it included data based on the type of resident. So these were things like race, nationality, immigration status, um, the structures themselves, so the residences, uh, the type of housing they were, the age, the materiality. Um, things like market values, assessment trends, even proximity to industry and floodplains. 
with my work as an architectural archivist, I see a lot of historic documentation that highlights disinvestment in later complications as communities are displaced for vast redevelopment projects. And here are just a few examples showing sort of change over time in the Northwest side. Next slide, please, thanks. Uh, so the consequences of redlining are expansive and compounded by numerous inequitable housing and development policies that are enacted at the federal, state, and local levels. We see the impact of these policies in today's issues, including racial wealth gaps, declining home ownership rates, eviction and foreclosure rates, neighborhood disinvestment, and all sorts of infrastructure challenges. And here's just many um, different headlines, but there's many, many more out there that are about this topic. So it wouldn't be a Jordan presentation without some maps. So I started compiling some different maps overlaid on our redlining map to see other connections we can make. So for example, this first map shows you the 1945 urban renewal sites overlaid on our redlining map. And you can see that they're all in the devalued yellow and red areas. Next, I have a map of the highway system routes, which are again, almost all overlaid on these yellow and red devalued neighborhoods. And this doesn't stop just historically. Um, it even, you can see these trends in more recent data. So my next map shows you the different savvy generated polar center um, gentrified areas. And these are showing your change over time um, starting in 1990 and you can see it grow. But again, these are a lot of those yellow and red devalued neighborhoods. In the following map, you will see the 2016 eviction lab eviction rate data. So the larger dots here represent more evictions predominantly in, again, these yellow and red devalued neighborhoods. And lastly, um, we've seen with the recent Opportunity Zone legislation, um, there's certainly a concentration of overlapping in these devalued red line neighborhoods. So I hope um, looking at these visuals, you can see this accumulative negative impact redlining policy has had on Indianapolis and, and sort of these connections to these consequences. And with that, I will hand the program over to Daisha Murphy for our panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Um, and, and thank you so much, both you and just the Indiana Historical Society for always making space for these type of community and conversations, they're extremely important. Um, so like Jordan said, I'm Stacia Murphy and I'll be your moderator for tonight. Uh, most of my work in Indianapolis has centered around uh, the inclusion or exclusion of disenfranchised communities, especially in the decisions that affect their lives. Currently, I'm a PhD student in American Studies at IEPUI and I'm focused on equity within economic and community development. Also, I work on inclusive growth strategies at the Indianapolis Chamber of Commerce, and I'm also an equity fellow for the Kepper Institute. So again, to our friends in the audience, we do expect this to be a rich conversation. I'll give a few minutes to each of our panelists to talk a little bit about themselves and their background. Following, we'll get into the panel discussion, and just after that, we'll get into a Q&A with you. So if you do have questions, again, either post them in the chat if you're joining us on Zoom or in the comments se section in Facebook, if you're joining us from Facebook. So as a moderator, I have the pleasure of welcoming our panelists. With us tonight, we have Unai Miguel Andres. He's a, <clears throat> a GIS specialist or in data analyst for the Polis Center and works on the community informatics team. Welcome Unai and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're here today. Hi, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as the stage said, I work at the Paula Center, which is an applied research center that focuses on space and geography. Um, so I've been with the Paula Center for three years. One of our major program is Savvy, in where we create a lot of actionable information about Central Indiana region. And I'm here to kind of show a little bit of the interesting facts that we find through digging through space and to bring another perspective to what Jordan was saying that even though 
redlining was a thing of the past, its effects can still be seen in the present. So if I can get some slides up really quick, perfect. So in here, I'm showing you that despite uh, red line maps and Hulk being abolished before that and the Fair Housing Act established, being established in 1968, uh, still in 1970, over almost 75% of black residents in Indianapolis lived in these neighborhoods that were qualified as or graded as C or D, way beyond or farther more than any other race within the city. And this trend also continues to 2016, uh, while despite um, residents being able to move more free, freely based by, due to a lot of legislative changes and a lot of uh, judge and court decisions, we still have a bigger discrepancy, uh, a big discrepancies between races within the city of where people live. And these neighborhoods tend to be really disinvested. And it's not only disinvestment uh, based on things that were not put on, but things that have disappeared from them such as some locations. Next slide. Here I'm showing you where the grocery stores within the city are. And you can see that they are across a lot of the highways and areas that developed uh, in areas that did not exist in the 1940s. However, um, if we go to the next slide, we can see that this has a major impact of where people are food insecure today. So I'm showing you here some areas that are considered food deserts and to different degrees of how many people live food insecure or without access to food in these areas. And you can see that a lot of them align right on the dot with these degraded investment maps from HLC. But it's not only, only the services that people received, it's also where investors want to invest the money today. Next slide. So I, here I'm showing you a map from um, a couple of firms that put together uh, new grade systems for neighborhoods in Indianapolis. And they grade them A, B, B, C, C, D, and D. And you can see that a lot of those that are graded as a C, D, or even D uh, are aligned with those neighborhoods that experience disinvestment. So these are places that have experienced a long-term disinvestment and now housing um, investors don't really want to put that money in there in yet, which causes bigger impacts on people's lives. And next slide, which is my last one. This is another way to look at investment. This map on the left comes from DMD, where they did a market, the Department of Metropolitan Development of the city, where they did a market value analysis of neighborhoods that were regional centers or those that were, that had a lot of strength. Um, and all the orange ones are those that are disinvested neighborhoods that don't have any strengths on them. And this comes in big part because nobody wanted to put money on them in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they're still struggling today. So that's all I have. So I'm going to send it back to Stacia. Thank you, Unai. Um, very important context for us today of why redlining is still important. Also, we have with us today Wild Style Pichel, United Northwest Area or UNWA Native and Community Advocate, who's worked on various community initiatives, including affordable housing projects to community gardens. As a writer and an artist, he challenges us to think critically about issues concerning the community and never fails to keep people at the center. Wild Style, welcome and tell us a little bit about your background and the lens with which you're bringing to the conversation. Thank you, Stacia. Um, I'm not an academic, so let, let me put that out there, but um, I do a lot of research and I am from a redlined uh, community. And in, in fact, historically, my, my ancestors are from Indiana Avenue, and that is one of the, you know, one of the first redlined communities here at, uh, in the state. And Growing up uh, in the Unwa area, uh, you know, even back into the 80s, it was disinvested. Uh, and at the time, you know, as a kid, you don't understand why things are, you just know that they are. And the explanations were, you know, always different, but this was during the crack epidemic. And so we blamed it, you know, everything on, on drugs and and this and that, but in reality, a lot of it centers around racism and not just the the type you you see with a, a hooded Klansman, but 
racism in policy and racism in, um, in a systemic fashion with uh, our financial system and the uh, uh, local government on how they treated uh, uh, black neighborhoods uh, uh, and other minority neighborhoods as well. So from that lens, as I started learning more about it, I started doing my, more research and I ended up writing uh, an article called uh, Indiana Avenue, the Ethnic Cleansing of Black Indianapolis that it talked about in a little bit more detail what actually happened to uh, Indiana's Harlem or, or Black Wall Street uh, and, and told and kind of bucked the narratives, you know, many of the narratives would suggest that um, we lost this Black cultural district because Black people moved away and didn't want to be there anymore because they all went to live in a, a post-racial society uh, with, with white folks in their neighborhoods and integration and increased racial equity. And that just wasn't the truth. And the problems that caused the destruction of, of that community um, haven't been solved to this day. So, you know, that's one of the things that um, I feel like I, I'm not an expert, but I know a little bit enough to to write about and highlight the issues. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Wild Style. Something we say sort of in community organizing is that you're always an expert on your own experience. So I'm really happy to see that you're getting your voice and your perspective out there. Okay, finally, welcome to Paul Mullins. He's a professor in the Department of Anthropology at IEPY and docent at the University of Oulu in Finland. Did I get that right, Paul? Yes, you did. Okay, awesome. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences that you're bringing to the conversation? Thanks, Stacia. Um, I'm a historical archeologist, so I study the relationship between racism and materiality. My focus in the context of this conversation is on urban renewal in the near west side. I'm interested in the displacement of that historically African-American neighborhood that um, Wild Sal just talked about. Um, and I'm interested in that displacement by my employer, by Indiana University and IUPUI, and also city planners and highway construction um, developers as well. And I'm interested in how the effacement of that landscape and our experience of it today can be uh, turned into a form of reconciliatory heritage that we can begin to talk about racism and how it's affected the material world. Methodologically, I do some conventional archeology. span I dig stuff up from the ground, but I also deal with other kinds of archeological artifacts like landscapes. And I also do what I suppose you would call kind of a subversive, subversive genealogies. So I'm interested in telling everyday life stories of people who lived in the near west side and along Indiana Avenue, what their worlds were like. And my, I think my, my, um, my goal in all of this work is to own up to the university's complicity in urban displacement and use that admission as the first step in discussing um, reconciliation and as a dimension of kind of facing up to the effects of race and racism and even reparations. Thank you, Paul. And again, thank you to all our pan panelists for joining us tonight to expand the conversation on redlining and its impact on Indianapolis today. So first question, we heard a little bit from Jordan on what redlining means, but I wanna hear from each of the panelists Personally, what does redlining mean to you and how does it influence your work? And anyone can start. Um, I'll go. Uh, um, redlining, I think the traditional term, I think uh, in the climate and the time we're in is, is been expanded to, to really just mean discriminatory uh, financial practices against blacks and Jews and, and other minorities o over the history um, of, I guess, home loans. And one of the things that, that I understood about, you know, or, you know, about redlining was the federal government's role um, in, in uh, kind of 
codifying that in law, but one of the things I'm just learning is that before the, the 1930s and before the federal government codified that in law, um, home loans as we know it today did not exist. So when before the, the Great Depression, home loans were usually you paid 50%, uh, almost a 50% down payment, and the terms were five to 10 years at the most. And at the end of that, you either paid off the principal or you attempted to refinance. And so when they created what is what we now call um, uh, home mortgages, which are 15, 20, 30 year mortgages, that's when they immediately moved to uh, stop a lot of uh, other racial groups from ha uh, being able to partake in this new financial system. And I'm happy to add to what Wildstyle just said. You know, for me, redlining is a constellation of public practices as well as legal codes that regulate residential settlement across color and class lines. Some of this is codified in the law. So much of that work that's done in the 1930s and 1940s is truly uh, embedded in law, but much of that discriminatory practice was simply um, recognized as, as public practice. So what realtors had been doing since 1910 in Indianapolis, you know, that practice was simply codified by the HOLC in the 1930s. And that became the kind of, um, that became a planning mechanism for what the landscape was gonna look like in the 1940s and 50s. From my perspective, redlining is, uh, I, I don't look much as what it was, but rather what it has done. And the fact that people are not aware of the long lasting effects that it had by governizing a practice that was being taken place. So I try to look at it from the perspective of people need to be informed and there has to be a process in this case by the government to overdone what they did, <laughs> to overturn what they did by now invested in communities that were completely disinvested and help those community groups that have fought for years through community development to keep their houses and try to improve the living quality. So uh, I look at, it's a process that needs to be repaired and not something that needs to be forgotten. As we try to understand um, the long lasting effects of redlining, it might be helpful to talk about what neighborhoods looked like prior to redlining. Um, Unai, can you talk a little bit about what neighborhoods look like po prior to redlining policies? Um, so I'm not that huge in historical background like some of my fellow panelists here, like Paul Mullins. Uh, however, a lot of these neighborhoods uh, were where people were able to come put their houses on and they were able to, they build capital themselves in that way. And they were able to pass the capital on for future generations. The problem with redlining was that then um, some of these individuals were not able to move to other parts of the city or that other individuals that might want to come to some neighborhoods would not be able to do so if they didn't have the capital and the materials and work effort to do it themselves. So that was one of the major issues was I mean, the city was still developing. The city was, the city was not what it was, to, what it is today, right? It was a fraction of it. Paul, did you care to kind of illustrate what happened before redlining as well? Yeah, maybe if, if you know, to extend what Unai uh, just said, you know, there are neighborhoods that are spatially segregated in Indianapolis since early as the 1870s. So like along North Street near where it crosses what's now called University Boulevard, there are little pockets of African-American communities that are quite stable and will last that way really until the university moves them out in the 1970s. However, we also up and down Indiana Avenue, you will find white and black people living alongside each other into the early 1920s in some neighborhoods. Um, and then, you know, places like Ransom Place, which is on the north side of Indiana Avenue, that actually 
is a relatively integrated neighborhood in the 19, 1890s, but in 1910, it is overwhelmingly African-American. So the thing that happens when Indianapolis neighborhoods segregate, they tend to do it very, very rapidly, and they do it in a very kind of checkerboard piecemeal pattern. And by the late 20s, early 1930s, um, the landscape really looks truly segregated at just that moment when the HOLC maps begin. And that's the sort of landscape of segregation that you and I can see as we move around the neighborhood, move around the community today. Just a follow up to that. You talked about more integration prior to redlining. Was that still social integration as well as physical integration? Oh, not at all. This is, there is, there is a measure of social integration in some activities. There are some activities that are all, always some practices that are always segregated. Churches are like that, for instance. The school system has a tendency to segregate relatively rapidly, but some businesses, on the other hand, are relatively integrated into the early 20th century. So it's very kind of hit and miss. Um, but the thing that, that's really interesting, you know, after the turn of the century, it's when neighborhoods when neighborhoods segregate, it's very unusual to find white and black people living side by side or facing each other. You tend to see kind of a hundred percent segregation, and that happens in a very kind of domino pattern as you move through the city. Wow, Style, I saw you shaking your head a lot. Is, have you found that rapid segregation happen in your research or in your experience? It seems like that, um, I definitely agree with them as well. I have a neighbor um, that lived, he moved in from the, the west side as it was being taken over uh, the very early wave in, in the 50s by IU. And he moved to uh, about uh, just north of 30th Street on um, Clifton, which is you know near Martin Luther King Street. And he moved in in 1957 and he st said he still had white neighbors on both sides of him. And within a couple of months, uh, both neighbors moved. And I have, a, I have a neighbor that lives next door and she was here uh, around that time. And she said there were still white fam a lot of white families on the street I'm in. And it's almost like clockwork, but right after that, the highways came through and um, displace some of the people. In fact, the, the gentleman I'm talking about, he can no longer park his car uh, in front of his house because there's a highway there in front of his house now. But they, he talked about things went quick, like um, in the 50s that, that once he got there and, and everybody else started uh, moving north of 30th Street that it was real quick. What we haven't talked about right now, but is a little inferred in our conversation is, how does the history of racism, racism um, and particularly white supremacy and some of our planning practices in the urban environment factor into the system of redlining? I can speak on that. Um, particularly when you look at um, the Indiana Avenue near West Side area, um, at the time, now, you know, much of the city was carved out of a swamp, but that was really a swamp. You had uh, White River there, the canal in Fall Creek. Um, at one point, um, you know, there were tomato bits coming. There was a cannery. It was tomato bits coming in the waterways. It was all types of pollution later on. But when they first moved them, let everybody move there, there was malaria. Um, so, you know, from a perspective, that, that racism and xenophobia, because um, it, it was black and immigrants early on, it was a, a, a perception that, that you can take this less desirable uh, area over here that's actually un probably unsafe uh, uh, for you to live in and you can do what you want with it, just don't bother us. So, you know, the, the, the element of racism is what drove everything. Um, uh, back then, even if it wasn't um, explicitly said. 
And in many ways, it is explicitly said, you know, there are realtors in the teens and 20s that are very clear about deed covenants that restrict to, to Caucasian, um, Caucasian tenants. You begin to see neighborhood associations that will sometimes call themselves protective associations emerge in the 1920s when a single African-American moves into the neighborhood. We have a number of those um, examples of those kinds of things happening in the 1920s. So I think the thing that's happening in the 20s, you know, that kind of post-World War I period is all of this latent white supremacy and racism begins to be spoken publicly. And the HOLC just begins to say in the 1930s, this is federal policy. We say in the light of day, what we always believed in the sneak thief of night. You know, that's what's beginning to shift in the 20s and 30s. Speaking of that, are there other ent entities that really helped promote this redlining policy and this um, legacy of racism and white supremacy? Either at the state or the city level? I, I actually, um, I think the really important foot soldiers are realtors. Um, they're really the ones that do some of the most damage and they do it in the most subterranean possible way for a really long time. And neighborhood associations have often been part and parcel of this process and continue to be long after World War II and really into the 21st century. You know, I think actually, I mean, there clearly is a lot of complicity at a city level and among planners and developers. Um, but I think sometimes we have to um, look down at that everyday level because I think um, realtors and protective associations, neighborhood associations have often been the foot soldiers. Yes, uh, even in the present, uh, there's a lot of uh, homeowners associations that require uh, a new homeowner to be vetted before they can fully purchase a shared property like a condo or a multifamily property nowadays in Indianapolis. Uh, so if, if you're in a society where it's seen and approved by the government uh, to discriminate based on race and nationality and income, then these groups are gonna, they're gonna segregate. They're, they're not gonna want people that have those characteristics and as Paul Sale just said, uh, neighborhood associations had a strong power and so did the realtors that tried to show people or tried to take them individuals that they knew that might not be even welcome in some areas and take them to some other places, not even bothering to show them or given the chance to get into a specific neighborhood. When I've often heard uh, conversations about redlining in the past, um, it's often talked about as if it's a sort of dead phenomenon and that it has no impact on today whatsoever. When thinking about the economic and racial segregation created by redlining, how does it persist today? Again, I'll turn it over to Unai first to answer that one. Can you repeat the question? You were cutting off on my end. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So I, a lot of times when I hear the discussion about redlining, it's talked about as if it's a past phenomenon and that it's dead and it has no impact on today. When thinking about the economic and racial segregation that was created by redlining, can you talk a little bit how it's persisting today and how it shows up now in our planning policies? Yes, uh, so how it shows today, uh, it's as simple as people, if your parents or your grandparents were able to purchase a house or they were able to live in a neighborhood that had access to more opportunities, you are today going to be start better off. You might even have the chance to inherit that house or they might be able to save money to put you through college. Um, so a lot of the times, a lot of the research that we do within Savvy and the Polo Center, we look at different social issues. We talk uh, food access, we talk health care, we talk poverty, and everything comes to race at the end of the day. There's big discrepancies within Marin County based on race that are really based on where people lived since that's normally one of the factors that we accomplish. Um, chances of or number of people in poverty, big discrepancies based on different races. Uh, so, and even though we have started to an equality um, situation, we, we have to try an equality society where we give the same chances to everybody. We forget 
that people will start at different points. And we need to change into an equity perspective where policies need to be more equity focused rather than equality focused, which is the current legislation. So and recognize that some people have been deprived from chances and opportunities from the past. So if I tell you, let's start a race, but you start 50 meters ahead of me, if we both can raise the same amount, you're going to get there faster than me. And we know lending we policies of banks are, have been, or remain enormously inequitable despite the law. We know realtors still do many of the kind of same steering mechanisms that happened in the past half century. So in many ways, um, it's, the, the code may be in place, and that's sometimes what apologists will point to and say, well, there are laws in place to make things equal. But that's only the first step. Practice is the thing that we still have to catch up with as a society. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Style. Yeah, I, I would agree with both of y'all that um, it, it continues on today. Um, and from a perspective that some of the same problematic uh, entities are there, the, um, the realtors for one have have been accused, <laughs> and from my perspective, I, I believe it's true uh, of steering uh, black home buyers in certain areas. I can remember when my aunt was uh, looking for another house in the 90s, and she, she had a, a white realtor, and they kept showing her homes in Butler, Tarkington, and she, you know, they were older homes, and we went with her, and she was like, I don't want this. I don't, I don't want, want this, and she they had lived on the Far East side for a long time. So she ended up finding a, another house on the Far East side. I remember my parents all the two times that they were looking for homes. Uh, when they finally got ended up getting a good deal on the house and they wanted me to be in Warren Township uh, so that I could go to Warren Township schools, they had to go get a, a, a black uh, realtor because the white realtors kept showing them certain homes in certain areas um, at certain price points and, and everything else. And, you know, from my perspective of doing community work, when we, we, um, we tried to work out some relationships. So we thought with, with banks and we were sent to, to uh, one bank and, and we were telling people to go there. But one of the issues was uh, the bank didn't deny any, any of the applica you know, applications, they simply didn't answer the emails, so the applications uh, could never get through to them. So, you know, there's so many levels to it that um, allows people to skirt the law and, and never be held accountable for it. And a lot of it is, is um, you know, it's just the modern mechanisms um, and, and some of the old mechanisms. The realtors are the ones that, that steer you to the banks and now if, you know, if they don't want to deal with you, they just won't, they won't follow up uh, with emails and phone calls. Switching gears just a little bit. I'm curious to understand maybe the role that narrative plays in all this. While style earlier, you talked about growing up as a kid on the far east side, thinking some of these practices had more to do with drugs than racism. Can you talk a little bit about that perspective now as an adult? Well, I think, you know, so we, when we, I, I, we first lived, uh, I grew up was uh, right in Riverside and then we moved to the Far East Side um, because the, the neighborhood that my mom had, they grew up in had deteriorated a lot. And then when we, we moved out there, we, we also found a lot of problems, but um, a lot of it was, it is due to the concentrated poverty, uh, lack of opportunity, um, particularly on the Far East Side, um, the um, at the time when I, I really you know started to understand, we had a lot of slum lords, um, and I'm talking about big apartment complexes because people were were renting from the apartment complexes out there, and and I remember people living. This isn't the Far East Side, but I remember people living in the meadows, and there being cockroaches, the biggest cockroaches I'd ever seen in my entire life there and understanding it when I came into their house, 
there were cockroaches everywhere, but the house was clean. It was very clean that, you know, they were doing everything they could. So this was uh, out of their control. So there was a lot of um, other elements to this that, that I feel have, um, you know, we don't talk about the, the lax laws uh, with landlords, the, the, uh, really the, the greed that, that, that's been involved in, in keeping people in, in housing that, that they can barely afford in the substandard uh, way so that they can never get a down payment for a home in the first place um, if they could get a loan. So, I mean, there's just so many different, different levels to this. And I think most people understand um, if you're not of a certain income level and you're black, you can you can you know rest assured that you're not even considering uh, buying a house because you you just know better and it's not not worth getting your hopes up and and trying to fight fight all that. Same question uh, to Paul: Does narrative play a role in all of this at all? Does what? Narrative. In what way? What, how would you define that? So I heard uh, Wild Sal talk early on in his introduction about not understanding that a lot of these practices are steeped in racism. And I'm wondering if narrative creation around some of these issues plays a role in that. And how important is that role? Yeah, I don't, that's a complicated. I think one of the narratives, one of the dominant narratives in the city is that, you know, we now have civil rights law and we have since whatever, the 1960s. So we now no longer, you know, now we are an equitable, we're the post-racial society. We're an equitable society. So I think uh, in, for many people that they don't have an experience of being segregated. They don't have the experience of being treated every day in residential housing um, by racist realtors. So that stuff, they just don't realize that exists. And I think actually that's the piece of consciousness that we have to, um, that we have to introduce to the discussion for a whole lot of white folks who are outside of that experience. There's a question from the audience that's sort of related to this. How do we communicate this history and these issues to the larger community so that they can help make change? I thought it was appropriate to ask at this time. Uh, I think the most important way to pass this on is by anybody attending here, bringing it to their communities. Um, I think a community-based transformation or communication effort, it's crucial. Um, the more people that are aware of the issues, the more action that can be taken or the more people supporting possible action. Um, it's obvious that for a long time, the government has act not only in this, but in multiple other efforts by disinformation or avoidance of information or knowledge. So attending everybody that is here, it's doing already something great to try to pass on this information and take some action. Um, so I encourage, take it to your congregations, take it to your neighborhood associations, talk about it to your friends. Um, this is going this recording is gonna be in YouTube, share it with people, try to make them understand Try to have people come and talk for people that might not be fully convinced when you chat with them. Uh, talk with your legislators as well. Uh, it's not uncommon. Some of them might avoid talking about it or thinking about it, but other ones might not realize how much impact it might have in their communities. And they're there for, to support you and you should request your, their support. Uh, they might reach farther than you can. But I think the most important part is taking these narratives that we're talking about and pass them on and democratizing this information, it's crucial. I would say from, from my perspective as well as we, um, for people to go make the change, I think they, they first need to recognize that the system is uh, from its outset has been designed not to work uh, uh, for blacks and other minorities in this country. And uh, I think what since 1968, we've been trying to put band-aids on it. And when we look at the statistics, the bleeding is profuse. So I think, I think there, there needs to be 
uh, some, some acceptance that how things work currently with housing and finance isn't working and that, that we need to seek other alternatives uh, to make sure that people have safe, uh, equitable um, housing for a change in this country. And, and it may not be uh, rolling out another um, Community Reinvestment Act um, uh, uh, program and financial literacy classes for uh, for blacks. So that, you know, particularly that. Right before, I'm sorry, Paul, were you going to say something? Well, I think I would just echo what those guys said, but I think, you know, the thing I'd add to it is uh, sort of a historian is that um, I think one of the dilemmas is that there's so little historical consciousness of the brutality of everyday racism that it's easy to ignore it. Um, you know, people don't learn this in school. I have students and faculty and, you know, colleagues who know nothing about the landscape's history. They don't know this heritage. They don't really know anything about the avenue. Um, and that makes it a lot easier to accept privilege. It's a lot tougher to let that pass if we know this history and understand that if we have a half millennium of structural racism that set up this moment. I just think that's where good activism is going to come from. So before I get into um, the questions from the audience, which are piling up right now, I want to ask one last question of the panel. Uh, how does gentrification affect, or actually, is gentrification related to redlining at all? And if it is, how so? Um, I'll speak on that. Um, Gentrification would be a lot more difficult to, to happen if people had, had equal access to the financial system and were able to um, buy their homes. I think when, um, when gentrification happens, first of all, it's almost, to my knowledge, I've never seen any, anything but a uh, public-private partnership, which meant the taxpayer money went to some redevelopment plan and oftentimes the leadership will say, well, be, uh, we need to do something. And then we've noticed that, that once blacks become middle class, they just leave this neighborhood because they, they hate it too. And the reality is that um, homes in my neighborhood, um, you know, back five, six years ago were $25,000 move-in condition. And you cannot get a home loan for for twenty five thousand dollars, not only do uh, not only uh, can uh, many of them not originate loans under fifty, um, and even at fifty thousand, they probably don't even want to talk to you, and they're not going to answer emails. You're not going to get a call back about stuff like that. And so I, I think you know when we talk about you know fair access, um, the the value of black. Uh, homes in, in predominantly black neighborhoods is lower and it allows um, the blank slate um, that, that was um, talked about with this 719 development, that blank slate of, of being able to come in and, and you don't feel like there's anything there and you can just do whatever you want for a really cheap price because most of the residents have been uh, locked out of ownership and the ones that do aren't sitting on as valuable of a, a property as it as it would be a white neighborhood. And so, honestly, that's how capitalism works. You you buy low, and you sell high. And and so the system, unfortunately, is is working for some people the the way they want it to to work. And, and so you know we have to to look at the real cost of human suffering. Uh, uh, for everybody to, to keep getting rich off of development. Um, so, well, so Jack hit it on. Uh, it's, we're in a capital society where money moves everything. It's the value that it takes. So, it's, you can tell, therefore, that, yes, gentrification and redlining in Indianapolis, they're linked because this neighborhood got completely disinvested. Value of all those properties were zero dollars almost like they were being sold a lot of land by five thousand dollars fifteen thousand dollars or even less so people with money 
In this case, people that were able to leave those neighborhoods and build capital, normally investment firms from outside the community, came, bought them all in bulk, built houses, and now they can sell them for two, three, four times what it cost them to buy the property and build them on. And that has then a landfall effect that all the property taxes next to those new places that got sold really high go up. And it forces and, kick out and kicks out the few individuals that were able to stay in those neighborhoods and own their houses. Because even though they don't have a mortgage at all, now their taxes raised by 1,000% or 5,000%. And they cannot afford that new payment that just destroys their budget with their income. So that's one of the issues. And there's the flip side of that, which is building community, which is when the community itself tries to rebuild or improve and put funds within the community to build it on at a scale that is sustainable to everybody. It's not taking advantage of the empty properties, but rather saying, hey, there's a lot, they can land here, let's try to do something with it. And they invest a slower, it's a slower sale return. And it's not done for the purpose of making money on that property, but rather for the purpose of improving the neighborhood. And that's a really distinct theme. Uh, community building effort normally comes within the community and it's more racial friendly and, and less segregative than a gentrification effort that an outside force that profits from it just comes and kicks everything out. But if there was not this investment due to red line, there would not be opportunity for investment to happen. Yeah, I think that's the big point. Um, gentrification is the logical end result of redlining. It is what redlining was meant to produce. It was meant to deflate real estate values, drive out particular communities, create empty land at a low price that could then be invested in by outside developers. This is exactly what was intended to happen on the eve of World War II and in 1950s planning. This is the sort of dream that after World War II, planners wanted to clear the American city and start again with that proverbial blank slate. And they were helped along in that process enormously by having the Homeowners Loan Corporation maps as the sort of blueprint for the future. Paul, you, earlier you mentioned the concept of reconciliation. Can you talk a little bit more about what that would look like? I think actually reconciliation will simply start um, first with historical consciousness. We don't have that yet. So it's very difficult to have the next conversation, which really has to be about reparations. You know, then we have to ask, what can we do to make this up? What structurally can we change? There are some things institutions like my university can do. You know, we have a whole lot of property. We have resources. Some of them are material. Some of them are intellectual. We have scholarship. Um, there are ways we can partner with the community. We invested in the Walker Theater as a partner. You know, there are potential ways that we can turn, we can turn this to a measure of reparation. I think we have to use that word though. I think we have to say that we're gonna work on, we're going to have to understand as an institution, we're complicitous in this change. We took advantage of it. We've now privileged from it. Now, what will we do so that we can have a just future? You know, how can we change that picture? Are there other ideas at uh, either reparations or reconciliation? Um. I'll still go ahead. Well, I, I would say um, we definitely have to get the truth out there. I, I think um, a lot of our institutions, uh, uh, starting with the city and um, IUPUI and other entities, especially the state, are still in denial about what urban renewal really meant. Um, and, and the type of position that they put their black citizens in. And so they, they're going to have to learn and then they're, they're going to have to put uh, forth the political willpower and money. Let me make that clear money uh, to go fix uh, the problems that they've caused for over 100 years now.
I, I think what Wildstyle said and what Paul said, it's just on point. It's co making conscious efforts, both educational, intellectual, and also monetary investments. I think it's time for the different government entities that have a play or that can invest to invest in those neighborhoods that were affected and enact some some law that provides funding directly to reinvest and bring these communities to the point that they could have been if redlining would have, wouldn't have happened while still giving protections to people that currently live there. Um, and that would also take an advantage against gentrification, such as putting cap limits to property tax increases for those areas that are experiencing outside investment. Thank you for that. Um, I am going to start reading some of the questions we've gotten from the audience. Um, I did give two in there, but they may be a little disjointed and we kind of are going back a little bit. So the first one is, what has been the role of city agencies and banks in redlining and these discriminatory practices that result in certain neighborhoods are unable to access funding for development? You touched on this a little bit earlier, especially Paul, um, but if you can just briefly talk about it a little bit more. Well, I, I actually, um, this is not really my area of research. Um, Amy Nelson, I think, I think is going to be in the, the next webinar. You know, I think she knows that, and Andy Beck, they know this terrain actually somewhat better than I do. But certainly, you know, I, one of the things that Wildstyle said a little while ago, you know, it's prior to the 30s, you know, most African Americans, there's not black capital, there's not black banks in this city. So capital is organized in very different kinds of ways on the ground. We have a very um, different rental and tenancy system. But then when home, own lo home loans, you know, become available, they don't become available to African Americans from that kind of post-World War II period onward. So the thing that ends up happening, I think, is that heightens inequality enormously. The housing, in, it heightens residential inequality enorm enormously. And banks have been very slow to do progressive things. This should not surprise us. Um, and also not only banks um, and the city itself, but also other capital uh, providing organizations such as venture capitals. Uh, I think they are not equally providing opportunities or enhancing the opportunities of possible black business owners that can bring that money and power back to the community itself. So it's, it's been a conscious decision not to deny, but not to approve, as well I was saying, make it hard to get or make it seem that someone it's not worthy to apply to get some of that funding. Um, so. Does city administration and also the banks have a role in, um, in addressing these issues or should we not think of them at all due to the history? I think they can have a big role. Oh, well, Stel, go ahead. I, well, yeah, I, I think they're going to they're gonna have to have a big role. They're the ones with the, the money and the power. Um, and <laughs> uh, as much as I would, you know, I think every everybody that's been in this position, every oppressed community has been in the, in the position that they would love to handle it themselves. If they could have, they would have by now. And so uh, the people with the power and the money, which is the banks and, uh, and the government and the politicians, they are gonna have to, to address and, and go support the community in, in, uh, and, and redis redistri uh, redistributing um, some of this money and power to fix things, you know, because this is, you know, it's caused quality of life issues for a hundred years now. And it, and if it's not fixed, it's going to cause the same thing a hundred years from now. And maybe they won't be on zoom. Maybe it'll be a, a hologram and they're appearing and doing these same panels to, to talk about the same issues and God, I hope not, but it's going to take uh, people with, with the power and resources to, to get behind doing the right thing. But I think we have to, you know, keep in our mind, the city um, has been enormously 
um, receptive to almost any economic investment for well over a century. Um, we are, you know, the city has always cut breaks for developers, for investors, and done that at the cost of tenants, people of color, and working class people in this city. And we continue to do that in the 21st century. So there really does need to be some aggressive leadership at the very top of the line that we have not really historically had. This is a city that's not been run by the mayor's office. It's been run by the Chamber of Commerce. And I think uh, a lot of banks and government agencies need to start putting more money, more capital towards this and advertising it because probably a lot of people here don't know the housing agency on the state has a program that provides down payment assistance as a forgivable loan for first time owners. They're not advertising in places where it should be advertised and people should be contacting and be told of the opportunities. They're just face lifting the, the organizations, it seems. And the same with some banks. They are like, yeah, we do have these programs to assist you, but we're not going to let you know that we can assist you. If you have the friends or you have the community contacts that can point you to that, then you're lucky. If not, it's like those didn't exist. And I think it's, it's a moment for them to do an effort and try to say, hey, this is how we can help you and make up for all the damage we did to you and your community. There's a question here about racial covenants. Even if they are now illegal to enforce, have they in fact been repealed in the communities or by state action? As far as I know, they have not. Uh, uh, we actually were having a conversation about a month ago and someone mentioned that they had to get the covenant deleted from the deed before they could officially purchase the house they wanted to purchase. So even though they cannot be created and they cannot be enforced, they're still legally binded to the description of the properties. So they need to actively be modified. Um, I think you all touched on this a little bit earlier, but more specifically, how does urban renewal, including interstate construction, play into redlining? Well, Redlining actually lays the groundwork for urban renewal and quote unquote slum clearance programs and highway construction. I mean, you know, that map that Jordan showed at the beginning, it's not by chance that all those property values, the deflated property values in those red zones are where the interstate, interstate snakes through Indianapolis. And it's not by chance that that serpentine concrete ribbon that slices through the middle of the city, goes through predominantly black neighborhoods and working class communities. I mean, that was all laid out by the HOLC in many ways. So it became a kind of a racist realtor's fantasy, you know, for future planning. Yeah, I, I, would, I would talk about, yeah, redlining. Uh, in my neighborhood, most of it is redlined, but three, Three or four blocks up from me is the start of Golden Hill, uh, which are million dollar homes over there. And, and that neighborhood pre exists my neighborhood, and my house is 100 years old this year. So it's old. And throughout the years, there's been all types of renewal projects and home renovation projects. They've never got any of that, and their neighborhood looks a lot better uh, than my street. They're doing just fine. And, and so, uh, you know, when, when it becomes wealth and, and access to financial capital, um, if everybody had that, we wouldn't be talking about any type of urban renewal. Someone's comment, my hometown was known as a sundown town. With redlining, was there a similar thing happening between neighborhoods? Not necessarily because of redlining, but I, I mean, I grew up in Indianapolis uh, where um, uh, um, uh, Stringtown was a sundown <laughs> uh, neighborhood. In fact, I don't, you know, as a teenager, I knew not to go over there sun up or sundown. Uh, Ravenswood was another one of those places. Uh, Fountain Square, um, I think, used to have a robust neo-Nazi uh, collective 
uh, there. So there, there was definitely, uh, you know, all the way up into the 90s uh, and in early 2000s, there was places in this city, uh, neighborhoods that, that uh, people of color knew not to, to go near or be caught dead in, especially at night. Can anyone speak to how tools like community benefits agreements can be used to help prevent gentrification or help restore the damage done by redlining? So community agreements or uh, movements such as land banking could be a perfect way to prevent gentrification. So for those that might not be aware of a land banking system or a bad or our land cooperatives, which are other methods, would be a way that uh, properties are purchased by a trust, and the trust makes a, and owns officially all those, but it provides uh, usage of the infrastructure different cooperative members or to community members. And they do this with the goal of maintaining community stability. And it's one of those community-based developments rather than outside forces coming in. And the whole point is to keep the property uh, from changing hands and disappearing by giving power to the community and ownership, by building that equity that they need. Yeah, I, I think this model could uh, very well work. The, um, land banking, community land trusts, uh, cooperative models. Um, Kepra Institute has, uh, is it's homes for all indie and they're working on developing everything needed to go to get a, a community land trust and i think that's important um because there is power in numbers and, and and when the community can collectively control an area they can act in its own best interests um in a way that singular home ownership can be um, undermined and destroyed by the redlining process, but if you can get uh, a cooperative models and this this works this this works in New York and other big cities um, and believe it or not, we already have a land trust in Indianapolis, but it 's an environmental land trust that people have put their property and deeded stuff over and 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 wheeled it out to a land trust for environmental reasons to create sanctuary spaces. So this model is, is already being used for, I guess, the uh, non-humans. It's, it's about time for us to get this to work for uh, human beings in Indi Indiana now. Uh, and also another important to build on what Walter was saying is that it's a model that function and it's normally used for environmental and housing purposes, but it also has a lot of power in commercial lending. Uh, so those neighborhoods that might not have a grocery store, well, it's really expensive and you don't make that much profit out of food or you don't want to if you're trying to provide food to your neighbors. But by using a building that it's owned by a land trust, they might be willing due to the benefit to the community to not charge rent for that or to provide entrepreneurs in the community a place where they can start up. So they're extremely powerful tools. I cannot hear you, Stacia. Can we transition back to gentrification for just a second and talk about um, the predatory wholesale buyers contacting homeowners? I'm happy to see this question from one of our audience members, because as you know, we were talking about this in our last meeting together. Yes, yeah, so pred predatory lending uh, practices are extremely unfair and they're targeted especially towards vulnerable houses in neighborhoods that they are posed to earn a lot of money. And um, If you own a house and someone tells you, I'm gonna buy from you for three times the amount of money that you paid and you don't need to do any remodels or we're forfeiting any appraisals and inspections, they're really tempting to do so. Um, however, that's where a lot of community support and education is crucial. Uh, providing people with the understanding of why they it's not good to do that and that it probably if they fix the housing itself themselves and they want to move and sell it they're going to make much more money uh, than just selling it right now 
um, providing support. So I know uh, for Housing Center for Central Indiana, Amy's here today, like they can help providing people with information and resources. They, it's really important to keep informed. And if you know, if you're receiving this type of lending and letters saying, hey, we want to buy this for you, or they're providing you mortgage uh, equity loans and things like that, the answer always should be no. And try to inform your more vulnerable neighbors that might not be aware of what are the drawbacks. Because sometimes it's as simple as, yeah, we do this, but you need to move tomorrow. And then you need to move and you don't know where to go. And you realize that, yeah, they paid you, you bought a house for $25,000 20 years ago. Yeah, they're giving you $100,000, but the houses now are three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. And you end up having to move to a neighborhood you don't want to, or you're not even able to afford moving. Um, so it's, it requires a lot of support and education. And, and I know, you know, definitely I've received many of those letters and, and they don't, um, you got to understand, you know, of course the market is buy low and sell high. So they're going to, um, if you talk to them, which I've talked to them just to see what they want, they won't tell you what they'll give you. They want to, they want to see how much of a bind you are, you're in, uh, so they can offer you the lowest uh, possible amount for your house. And in the midst of that, they target people. They, they'll be the ones that call um, code enforcement and, and will we'll, uh, uh, know how high your grass is in the backyard, whether uh, one of your gutters is broken off or, or anything that, that's a, a code violation. They know it, they drive by all the time and they will call somebody and they will have the city um, harassing you and, and finding you until uh, those letters and phone calls start sounding a lot more uh, palatable and, and you really do begin to think about uh, selling your house just to, but, you know, because you feel that it's just too difficult to keep up at this point. Another question from the audience, how has redlining in Indianapolis impacted funding to schools in, in the city and other educational programs? I, I can say that, I mean, it definitely keeps um, uh, the property values low. It keeps, um, it keeps things disinvested. And, and oftentimes when it, you know, as things are collapsing, you'll find that, that a lot of the houses are vacant and not producing any tax money uh, for the local school system. So it definitely uh, does have a, a real negative effect uh, on the school systems. And then when they're, uh, when the, the, they're, they're redeveloped, oftentimes there's tax abatements and all sorts of things that, you know, ultimately are taken out of the school system uh, to revitalize or, or, or renew. Well, and redlining also create, the redlining was the foundation for UNIGOV in many ways. And UNIGOV is what really guts IPS that IPS has never really recovered. So in many ways, you know, we can blame, I mean, there's a series of dominoes that lead up to UNIGOP and redlining clearly is one of the most important of those. Um, we are just about at time, but I do like to end with maybe a hopeful note. Considering the history and the legacy of racism and white supremacy in our and practices and planning, if you have hope in this moment, can you share that with um, the audience and what does it look like? Or yes. nobody has any hope? No, <laughs> I, I think there's hope. Um, I see more and more and more organizations and movements, grassroots movements coming through the city and uh, starting to ask for accountability uh, to the city and the state government and also the federal government. So I think it's important that people keep pressing. Uh, people are getting more conscious and more involved in the neighborhoods, which kind of gives hope of how things can change. If you show to Indianapolis 15 years ago, the only development that was happening was through major CDBG grants or home grants or some major investments that are outside forces coming in. While now you have CDCs, community development corporations, 
that are working with residents to provide things that are needed. And they definitely provide access and they're trying to build capital. So there's more programs now to help people get some forgivable loans to renew their houses and keep them up to date and change fundamental things that did not exist 15 years ago. So I think that's a way to provide capital to those neighborhoods without having to bring someone new in. So I think there's hope. <laughs> well, I'm an anthropologist, so I always have believed in people. I always have hope in people. And actually, um, we're in a moment of activist consciousness at a grassroots and a national level where I think there's a lot of reasons for optimism. I think when we're pessimistic, it's often because the state is not serving us as citizens or the state is serving a narrow range of economic interests instead of our personal interests. You know, I think we need to, um, I think we need to push the state and I think actually there's a lot of us out there at a grassroots level who are doing just that kind of work in neighborhoods, cities, and internationally. So I think there's lots to be hopeful about. Well, Sal, hopeful, you got the last uh, word. Yeah, I, I'm hopeful. Um, I see that, that there's so many, the, the new generation, they're so much more aware uh, of this than, than I was um, at their age. I mean, you've got 25 year olds that not only do they know what redlining is, they can tell you where it happened here. At 25 years old, I didn't know what redlining was. Um, so I, I am, I'm hopeful uh, that, that so many people are, uh, they're not confused, as confused about what was going on as I was at that age. And, and they're real, you know, they're actually uh, out here and working to change things. So uh, I, I'm hopeful for that. All right, well, we have reached the end of our time together and I've definitely found this discussion to be meaningful. Um, thank you to our panelists for taking the time tonight to speak with us. And thank you to our audience for submitting questions and engaging in the conversation. Uh, please keep the discussion going. This is just one of a series of events and I'll actually pass it over to Jordan to talk a little bit more about what's coming up next. Thanks, Stacia, and thanks to all of our participants tonight for your questions and comments. I know we didn't get to everything, but I think that we'll continue to have these conversations. Um, our panelists will continue to have these conversations and our incredible steering committee will as well. Um, so now we're going to do a poll again, um, like we did last time, and like we did in the beginning. So if you want to answer the poll. And while you're filling out that poll, um, you'll see we have the Living the Legacy program event um, information up again. We have that slide up. So um, just a reminder that Living the Legacy is part of a interdisciplinary conversation about the history and impact of discriminatory housing practices in central Indiana. I hope that you will join us in October and November for the third and fourth parts of this series. Um, you can find info on these programs and register at our website. Uh, tomorrow, you will receive a follow-up email from us. It will include a brief survey. We'd love to know what you thought about this program and how we can make it better in the future. And we will post this conversation to the IHS website in the upcoming weeks. If you want to catch the replay sooner, please find the recording on the Facebook live stream. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and healthy, and I can't wait to see you in October. Bye.